Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Hold My Dream, where we navigate the news and politics with a chaser of civility. I'm your host, Jen, inviting you to grab your favorite beverage, sit back, and imagine with us how to create a new American identity together. Welcome to this week's Hold My Drink and Counterweight podcast with my co-host, David Bernstein. Today, we have Adam B. Coleman with us. Adam has a new book out, Black Victor, Black Victim, I'm sorry, to Black, Black, <laughs> let me try that again, start over, Black Victim to Black Victor, and we're going to uh, hear a little bit more about his story behind that book, but before we do, Adam, did you bring a drink to the table for this conversation? Non-alcoholic, but it is uh, iced tea. Iced tea, okay. Hey, you're not from the South, are you? No, I'm not. Okay, because that's a iced tea is a very southern thing. I never got into <laughs> iced tea, but anyone who's like any in we in Texas we're called like the tea sippers. So there you have it. Um, David, you? So I, I'll have a diet coke, but I actually put some rum in it this time, which is you know a first. So it's a diet <laughs> rum and diet coke. That's it. <laughs> well, I haven't had a rum and diet coke in a long time. Mm. Okay, well, I needed a pick me up. Um, it's the afternoon, so I made coffee, but I made like the Christmas brew, and then I put um, whipped cream vodka in it. So mm. that's really like that's. I'm feeling that that's a very spirited holiday. That is. Yeah. So there. <laughs> Anyways. That is very spirited. <laughs> so, um, all right, Adam. I, your your story uh, is one of your life. And, you know, kind of how you became to, to be a Black victor. Uh, a lot of stories also on, I think, your relationship with your faith. Uh, a lot of stories on your relationship and um, identity and politics. I mean, you've got a lot to tell. So I'm just going to stop there. Will you mm -hmm. give us the, you know, the, not the elevator pitch. I don't want to, I don't want something short, but, you know, you just kind of a synopsis of um, who you are and where you are today. Sure. So um, my trade is actually in IT. Um, you know, I work with computers, uh, but I've always just been, um, I would say since I was 25, I've been into politics uh, off and on, just kind of following what's going on um, and just being kind of astute on the political realm. However, I will say that within the past, I would say three or so years, maybe three to four years, uh, my viewpoints on politics have slowly changed um, based on new information that I was able to receive. So um, I think everything kind of came to a head last year uh, after George Floyd and seeing how uh, the world was reacting towards his death um, and the narrative that was actually being painted because of his death, um, it felt like the media was painting my existence as a black American as in constant threat uh, that the police are out to get us all, um, which to me is ridiculous uh, today, uh, especially. Um, I've lived in five different states. Um, I've never had that experience. I've had encounters with the police, like most people, you get pulled over or whatever, but um, I never felt like I was in constant danger you know, that's a different experience. And that's a level of paranoia that uh, the media was trying to portray. Uh, and I saw people reacting to his death as being far bigger than it actually is and, and turning him into a martyr. Um, so there were, there were a number of things that I felt like I wasn't able to speak up for myself because the media was, you know, filling in the void and filling in and saying that uh, this this is the experience for Black Americans. So um, ultimately, it kind of came down to I was looking for free speech avenue, and just talking to people and, and expressing how I felt and got encouragement to write. Uh, and I had actually wanted to write a book, but I just had no idea what to write about. Um, and then it just hit me one day just to start writing, and it took me about nine months. Uh, published it myself, and um, you know, I had zero expectations to have anybody be interested, but I wanted to at least try. And, you know, I'm on a podcast like this today, 
So, you know, everything, everything that's come in my direction since has been, has been wonderful. Um, I also, during the writing process, I started wrong speak, um, you know, just an outlet for myself initially, but encouraging other people to express themselves, even if it goes against the narrative. Um, and so, yeah, I've been basically since I published the book, I've been kind of full force with wrong speak, uh, going, currently doing a redesign right now. Um, and trying to encourage as many people to speak um, openly and, and but intellectually. You, but yours in your life story too, though. I mean, where do you see you know from Victor to Vic, like start even you know what is your life story where you went from victim to Victor, um, and then also we can get into like the whole victimhood narrative. But sure. I know that you've had you know you you've got an interesting life story that kind of brought you around to where you are right now. So start start early. Sure. Um, Basically, like many Black Americans, I'm a product of a single parent home. Um, my father was seldom in my life. Um, I would hear from him every so often. I would see him once every so often. Granted, we live states away, so seeing him frequently was not likely, but um, there was no real care or love or concern from his direction. Uh, you know, he paid child support through the court system. Um, and I would see him very, you know, basically rarely. Um, so, you know, a lot of my relationship with my father was basically from a kind of a neglectful manner. Um, and it, it took me a long time to kind of figure out why I had, why I had so many shortcomings uh, as, a, as a young man um, and, and to try to break down what the, the different things that I was missing in my life as a young man, um, where I personally feel like these were things that I should have learned if I had a healthy father of my life. Um, you know, but basically, you know, as a kid, you know, my father wasn't around. My mother worked a lot. Um, at times she had two jobs. Um, there were a couple of times, uh, when I was younger that we were homeless, um, for a brief period of time. Um, at one point we were in a homeless shelter for a few months, uh, at a different point, we were bouncing around between people we knew, hotel rooms. Um, even at one point, someone we really didn't know, but, uh, we needed a place to stay. So, um, you know, we struggled at times and, and, and at times we were stable, but we also moved a lot. Um, you know, when I came to New Jersey, um, we moved a lot. When I lived in New York, we moved a lot. Um, so a lot of my life was kind of not stable on top of not having uh, a father figure in my life. So uh, even as an adult, there was a period of time where I was basically moving every year for whatever reason. I, I just never felt like a place of home. Um, so, you know, I, Funny enough, I just moved to this place this year. So um, my life is constantly moving. Uh, something is always changing in it. And, it, you know, for a kid, not having stability is detrimental. Um, but that's, that was basically my life. Today, how do you think that experience has sort of, I mean, you can easily imagine you going the other way, given that story, right? You can easily imagine saying, I've been a victim of this system, and in some ways you were, whether, you know, um, and um, and you can easily say that, um, you know, that fundamentally people don't have opportunity, yet you mm -hmm. see yourself as being empowered with agency. How did you come to that conclusion? It took me a long time. So one of the things, uh, you know, I give my mom full credit for, even throughout all those different situations, um, you know, she didn't really take handouts. We didn't, we didn't, you know, go on the system or anything like that. You know, we had basically speed bumps in our life. But my mom always worked. At times she would work multiple jobs. Uh, she would move for better job opportunities. So that was part of the reason why we were moving. Um, but my mom always kept going. So when even when I was struggling, I would take risk, I would keep going, uh, you know, I would have a situation happen, 
it would suck, but I would figure it out and keep going. So giving up wasn't really, um, wasn't really part of my mindset. The victim part was sometimes when I did hit like a, a low, you know, there were times that I had depression. There were times that I, you know, felt somewhat suicidal, um, you know, lacking confidence and thinking that, you know, there's something wrong with me or, you know, um, you know, just kind of like a pity kind of attitude. Um, but it's a, it's a mindset, you know, it's kind of a victim mindset where you want other people to kind of give you a leg up or, or feel sorry for you or, um, but it, it was something that I struggled with, you know, the mental health aspect, um, going in and out from it. At the same time, being a young father, I had my son at the age of 21. So trying to figure out myself, how to be a good father, um, and basically not repeating what my father did. Um, so, you know, I didn't know how to be a young man. I didn't know how to be a father. I didn't have that example. But the only thing I knew was I didn't want to be my father. So uh, I tried everything possible to kind of figure things out along the way. Uh, I have a great relationship with my son. Um, you know, I see he doesn't live with me, but I see him every weekend uh, unless something is happening. Uh, but we talk all the time. You know, I, I, we have open communication. So I, I basically tried to do everything that I think that I that I personally would think a good father would do. Um, and, you know, I'm sure I made mistakes along the way. You figure it out, but you just kind of keep moving. Um, but the, the victim part, I, you know, the title of the book, Black Victim to the Black Victor, part of it is me and then part of it is culturally. Um, so, yeah. Explain that last part. Part of it is me and part of it is culturally. What do you mean by that? What I mean is, um, you know, the more I kind of examine as to what is happening around me, what is being promoted, it is coming from a place of victimhood. Um, whether the media is involved, whether activism is involved, where we are constantly looking at, let's say, historical events, let's say slavery, let's say Jim Crow, you know, those are the two biggest ones that people always bring up. It is look what was done to Black people as the victims of these situations. Legitimately so. However, I try to look at it as look what we were able to overcome. It's the same situation, but it's a different way of looking at it. And so if you think from the mindset of look what was done to us, then where does that get us, right? We're always living in the past. We're always, you know, wanting some sort of vengeance or being paranoid of, you know, let's say the white man, look what they did to us then, they're gonna do it to us again. It's a very kind of paranoid way of looking at the world and you're, you're not able to progress forward. And I, I personally think that that way of looking at race uh, is something that permeates within people's personal lives as well, right? Mm. You know, Cause there's so many things that you could learn from people regardless of what they look like. Um, but imagine if that is a hurdle. You know, I was at, when, at a young age, I was told point blank, you can't trust white people. But, you know, for me, I was like, well, how does that make sense when I know white people who are good people and I know black people who are bad people, right? Just this is just me as a kid, right? It wasn't trying to me taking a side. I was just trying to make sense of why I should just trust one group of people and trust another group of people by default. It didn't make any sense to me. Um, and so I never really got part of the whole racial politics because um, even for myself growing up, uh, I got tagged with, you know, you're not black enough or, you know, you talk a particular way, you know, you're acting white. Um, mm -hmm. And I was just like, well, I'm, I'm not trying to be anybody else but myself. I feel comfortable being this particular way. Why is this the case? So I was always reluctant to, to um, have identity politics be the way I view the political sphere. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I eventually moved away from the left because as time went on, they became more and more obvious and more and more infatuated with identity politics. Mm. So I'm okay, I'm listening to you. I've got, I, you know, I, I think, you know, I'm writing a book, my co-author, Letters in Black and White, 
Yeah, mm -hmm. a black attorney in San Diego. And we have this debate all the time about, because he's also, he's very open-minded. Um, he refuses the victim narrative. It, you know, he's obviously he's had his, he's, a, he's an individual. He had his own life experiences. And for him, he thinks that a lot of the reason that he pushes aside that victim narrative, it, it's just, it's just who he is. He's just, it's just genetics. He was just, he was born that way, if you will. Mm -hmm. But we, when, in writing this book, you know, because there is a new, I don't know what's new, but it seems, well, it seems newer or more um, widespread now, this victim narrative, if you will. And we've been, lately, we've been doing some research, like Pew studies and whatnot, that says that 74% of Black Americans identify very, very strongly with Black culture. And that's not defined. I don't, you know, I, that's another question. I mean, you know, what's white culture? Yeah. What, what, what's, but anyways, but de, that that um, identify very much so in, um, in a more tribal sense. And that's not the same also. That's that the, the numbers don't show up for white Americans. Now, one could, mm -hmm. you know, he and I go back and forth because he's like, well, you know, you've got to be part of the 26%. You've got to be open-minded. I'm like, okay, but I can't, I can't, you can say that. But I mean, as a white American, I, you know, I, I know history. And if I was a black, I can't put myself in a, the shoes of a black American and say, you know, that I would not be um, upset and outraged and whatnot with, 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 with the history. And so, I don't know, I, 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 he and I go back and forth on that. We kind of, that's one of our points of disagreement. He just thinks, well, it's a personality thing. And mm -hmm. I'm like, hmm. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Is that true? So what do you think about that? Um, I'm similar to your friend as far as, you know, that conversation I, I said before about not trusting white people. That was at a very young age. And I still remember it. You know, that was just who I was. That wasn't like uh, an indoctrination kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I've always been very like questioning of certain things. Um, I will admit I wasn't questioning enough when it came to politics earlier on when I was getting into politics and I kind of go into that a little bit in the book, but um, I personally think that the cultural aspect is a, is a big play. You know, you were saying that it seems to be really, really big right now. And there are very particular reasons why it's happening. I think it's just been, it's been uh, exacerbated you know, but it's always been there, right? So this skepticism has always been there, but it's been mild, it's been somewhat tame. You know, there are always like fringe groups, um, you know, people who are on the extremes of distrust towards other people, uh, you know, being completely pro-black um, to the point of appearing anti anybody else. Um, so these things have always sort of existed. But I think what's happening now is it's hitting more mainstream and there's a reason behind it. And I've thought a lot about this, even after writing the book, that I don't think many people talk about. And so I'm talking a lot about it recently. Um, you know, Black people are used as political footballs, basically, to have some sort of social change. And it's been like that for decades. Um, but it's being now that especially the left is utilizing identity politics to such a heavy degree um, it seems normal but also at the same time what's happening is we are experiencing a cultural revolution and, and it's more of a marxist communist uh, cultural revolution that's happening all these things about social justice you know these are communist sayings um, all these things about equity right these are communist phrases um, you can look at the symbol for Black Lives Matter. It is a communist fist, you know. So you you know from understanding China, you know these concepts aren't new. You know they might be foreign to a degree, but they're not new. Um, you just give it a different application. And with a Marxist ideology, you you can basically make oppressor oppress oppressor to anybody, you know. So like gender theory, you you can always make straight people the oppressors. Uh, you know, feminism, you can always make male the oppressors, you know, black people, you can always make white people oppressors. So it's taking things that are relatively true, or to a degree, like to a small degree, and making it what is 
the absolute is basically it. So if you're someone who is a follower of this ideology, it is an absolute that as a black person, you must be skeptical, but it's done for a very particular reason. And I truly believe that um, even for people who don't realize that this has communist roots, uh, they're thinking that this is for some sort of beneficial thing. Social justice sounds nice, right? Why wouldn't we want some sort of social justice? It is, is ultimately for the gain of uh, or moving towards communism, right? Is it possible to happen here? I don't know. Uh, I think it's, we're a very large country. I think it's we're very individualistic. We really like freedom and we have a lot of people who fight against it, even if other people conform. Uh, you know, you can look at like vaccine mandates, for example. Um, so it's hard to say, but what I think is happening is the progressive movement is kind of the front for a Marxist movement that's happening in this country. And they're using black people as the social change. Uh, the government is using black people for policy change, right? So I remember Pete Buttigieg recently talking about uh, an infrastructure bill and um, I can't remember her name. She's a black reporter asking, would this address a racial, you know, all this stuff. I'm like, what does that have to do with the highways? And she's taking like one small kind of true fact from forever ago as to being the number one issue that black Americans face is the highways. Um, and he's like, yes, yes, we'll definitely use this money to address these systemic issues and problems for black. And it's just, a, it's a complete political ploy to keep moving. But, you know, that reporter is an activist and, and they've all fallen for the Marxist trick. They've all fallen for these, uh, you know, the, the communist plantings of, you know, change, social justice, equity, fairness, um, equal opportunity, you know, all these different things, all these buzzwords. And I hear it and I, and I can't help but to think, you know, we have so many communists <laughs> or people who just are, are, are not willing to understand that they're, they're, they sound just like communists. Um, and, and it's becoming more and more obvious to me. And so I've been writing about it more so recently because I want people to understand that there is a history as well. You can look at Angela Davis. Um, for example, these are people who were part of the Communist Party. There was a Communist Party in America at one point who was trying to push for this change, and we've forgotten about it. But this ideology has been with us for a long period of time. So Jennifer advanced a theory about certain personality types uh, who, you know, have to be individualistic or have mm -hmm. can't stand the idea that they're told what to think. That's me, right? And and actually, I have a whole set of theories around that too, and I agree with that. But there seems that there's another factor. You know, one thing that I've noticed is that many of the top thinkers who are pushing back against woke ideology are are black, and mm -hmm. um, and I, my you know I was like you know I mean it's really a dazzling array of people like you know McWhorter and Glenn Lowry and you know and I mean before him you had Thomas Sal but you have a whole a, a number of them and now you're joining their ranks and um, and I, it, it hit me that maybe one of the reasons for that is that it takes such an incredibly incredible act of intellectual will to transcend sort of a narrative that's so deeply ingrained or th that the society or that even your own community tries to ingrain that when you do do that you go through a kind of internal revolution yourself that is much more likely to produce the kind of intellectual firepower that we see from from these leaders than if someone who really didn't have to go through that kind of transition i mean i could have been anything i could have been a, a progressive i could have been a liberal i could have been a conservative and all of those would have flowed somewhat seamlessly for my life story. But mm -hmm. for you, you actually had to go through something much more powerful than I did to order to end up where you did. And I'm wondering if that might also be part of it. I mean, an artist who doesn't have pain may not be the best artist in the world either. Yeah, yeah no, that's a good point. And if you think about some of these people, uh, for example, Thomas Sowell, he admits that he was a Marxist at one point until he worked for government, <laughs> you know, he realized that this is, this is not the best ideology. And he became more of a um, uh, libertarian conservative type of person. 
Um, same thing with Walter Williams. Um, I think Walter Williams also had a, a little bit of a transformation too. Um, and became even more hardline and, and, and libertarian thought. Um, you know, you can look at Candace Owens, uh, former liberal, myself, former liberal. Um, although I've been saying that, and I, in the, in the way I wrote in the book was that I was a default liberal, right? And I kind of went down that path early on because what I was told when I was first getting into politics is that the Republicans are the are racist is essentially what was told to me. So when that's the first thing that you're told when you're getting into politics and there's basically two parties to kind of go after, that was the direction that I went. And so all my media was filtered through the left. Um, all my right, right wing opinions or right wing um, viewpoints, I should say, came from the left, which is, it's very interesting when I actually sit back and think about it, that I'm, I'm hearing right wing viewpoints from the people who oppose right wing people. Um, and I think that uh, for me, I was a default liberal, but there were certain things I was just not comfortable with that I was unwilling to change um, until I was kind of faced with better solutions, better information, and the willingness to say, F all this, uh, what do I really think about these things? Um, so yeah, I, I think for a lot of us, you have to be willing to push against what it feels like a heavy majority of people who lean in the other direction. Um, you know, I think we're like in an 80% block that votes for the Democrat party. Even if they reluctantly vote for the Democrat party, they still push in that particular direction. And there is association with race as to uh, or I shouldn't say race, but like culture, um, where we feel the necessity to kind of do things similarly to like a collective, right? And that also goes into voting. So for for people like us, uh, you know, the Thomas Souls, myself, um, or not to put myself on the same level as Thomas Sowell, but um, people who are okay with being labeled as being on the right, we stand out. And we're constantly having to explain ourselves as to why that's the case. Um, but what I think is happening is the failures of the left are becoming more and more obvious. And there are more people who are open to either saying, forget the Democrats and coming over to the right or staying center and being apolitical, becoming independent. I'm not a Republican. I, I remain as an independent. Um, but it, even with all that being said, I will always be labeled something that I probably am not. I will always be, you know, given some sort of uh, some sort of reason as to why I say what I say and why I'm doing what I'm doing uh, is because I'm trying to get white acceptance or because I hate being black or whatever. Um, so, you know, not everybody can handle that. Not everybody can handle public scrutiny. I personally just don't care because I've gotten to a point in my life where I've been through so much crap that some stranger online or from a distance thinks I'm a, I'm a coon or something like that, then, then so be it. You, you're not affecting my life. I, you know, I'm fine with who I am. I, you know, I've had a long journey and I explain myself even on Twitter, right? I'm, I'm starting to become known for writing these long threads because I want to explain myself, explain my position where people say, oh, that's a very fair position. I understand how you came to that conclusion rather than just putting shock stuff out there and people thinking I'm some sort of race grifter uh, or I'm, you know, I'm on the right to kind of stand out and get attention. I don't really care about that. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of almost like a, a sort of braveness to actually do what I'm doing. Um, even though I don't really feel that brave. But you are. You know, I, you kind of touch on something that I'm kind of putting a couple of pieces in my mind together on. Um, I'm like you, I'm an independent. I don't, I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. Um, you know, in this current moment, I think a lot of us have been labeled right wing just <laughs> you know, because that's the moment that we're in, even though that's, ridiculous we're liberal yeah. um but i've been told on you know and i've got 
some evidence to prove this, but I, I've been told on many occasions that a lot of black families would actually be considered if it wasn't, and I think you kind of touched on this, some of the traditions and some of the values would be considered quote, you know, conservative, but they, you know, you kind of vote with the block and the Democrat parties in the block. And you do see some transition. You mentioned like some names, you know, the Candace Owens and I've noticed some other people who are starting to go, ah, you know, I'm going to think twice. Mm-hmm. But here's an interesting um, phenomenon that I have been noticing. My husband and I were talking about this the other day. It's, I think that you can say the same too. And I hate to stereotype. So I, 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 know, I know that I know that I'm stereotyping, but a lot of times the other, another group that has been pushed into to that Democrat block has been a, mm-hmm. a lot of his, Hispanic and Latino, Latinx, whatever you want to call it, voters. And I think more recently, and I think a lot of them also have a, some traditional family values that most recently as the progressive arm of the Democrat party has ca- gotten stronger and more uh, vocal, you see a, a Hispanic population pulling back out of that democratic block as well and going mm, you're not really those aren't really my values do you um do you see that as as, as a trend i mean yeah a, across again we don't have to like pigeonhole black white hispanic whatever but i mean do you see that as a trend i, I feel like you you mentioned that that was a, a trend in some of the, what you were seeing so um, I would say overall, politically, regardless of race or ethnicity, I think that I am not alone in why I become somewhat politically homeless and, and moved away from the Democrat Party. Um, and I am not alone for the same reasons. I talk to so many people who feel lost because they feel like their party left them. Their party went farther left than they were comfortable with. They may be just the the old school liberal who just thinks we should have free speech and just common sense regulations and and maybe the government can help people. Um, And they're watching their party become race obsessed, become identity obsessed and catering to blocks of people rather than talking about what policies are going to help Americans, right? You know, I'm, I'm one of those people who feels like if it's a good policy, it'll help most people, right? But having racialized policies, stuff that's specifically for a, a particular block of people, I think always misses the mark because then it assumes that this particular policy is what this entire block is interested in. So for black people, we're only supposed to care about prison reform. Uh, we're only supposed to care about getting reparations. Uh, you know, for someone who's Hispanic, they're only supposed to care about immigration, right? All these different things. Um, but no, we all care about economics. We all care about gas prices. We all, I, like, I think politics ultimately comes down to economics. People care about their money, yeah. right? They don't really care about, you know, if you're the nicest person in the world. If we didn't have COVID and the economy stayed the way it was going, Trump would have got reelected and, and people would say, I don't care if he's a mean guy. Our gas prices are low. I've business is great. My savings is doing well. You know, the stocks going up, you know, they care about their money. They care about their economics that because ultimately that translates into how can I build wealth? How can I take care of my family? All these different things, having laws that, you know, having more, uh, hate, hate crime laws, right? To say we're in support of minorities who are targeted. We already have laws against, you know, assaulting people, murdering people, regardless of the reason. You know, these are these are show laws. These are show policies. Um, and so that's it's one pandering. of pandering. It's just pandering. It's pandering. Absolute pandering. Um, you know, that was, I'll, I'll, I'll say it like this. When I was completely done with the Democrat Party, it was during the this past election, during the Democrat process, because I was watching very closely. Joe Biden had not won any states, right? Um, honestly, he he was fumbling. He didn't know where he was. You know, the whole thing. And I'm thinking to myself, why is this guy still running? 
he goes to, I want to say it was North Carolina, which they kept emphasizing has a large black voting block. And they could not stop talking about reparations. I had been watching the highlights for all these other different uh, debates, never once talked about reparations. As soon as they got in front of black people, they could not stop talking about reparations. Uh, we laughed at Beto O'Rourke and, and uh, uh, was it Cory Booker speaking Spanish and battling it out, <laughs> you know? And I'm just laughing like, do you see these? Like I work with mostly uh, people who are Hispanic, Dominican and all this stuff. I was like, did you watch them speak Spanish? And they're like, oh my God, those gringos, it's hilarious, <laughs> right? But it's this political identity, political pandering that all these politicians on the left started just full, you know, head first into. And uh, I saw that reparations aspect. And then I saw the, the level of corruption behind blocking out Bernie Sanders while everybody dropped out except for two people. They stayed in long enough. So Biden got enough delegates, then they dropped out, right? And I'm saying to myself, they are identity obsessed, they're corrupt. Um, and, you know, even, even for me, who's talking about progressives, I was like, well, let this be fair. Let Bernie have a fair shot and see if people want to pick him. And and saw how the media was treating it. And all these different things just made me sick and tired of the Democrat Party. And I was done at that point. I was done being, uh, you know, blue no matter who and, or, and all this other nonsense. Um, and, yeah, I, I think the identity aspect and the constant pandering Kamala Harris going on Hot 97 and talking about she smoked weed. You know, I'm Jamaican, right? Blah, blah, blah. You know, it, it's this, oh, it, it just makes me, it makes me ill inside when I hear this coming from a politician. Um, and it ultimately made me done. I don't see it so much from the right, um, but I'm fearful that they are reactionary towards the left. Um, that they say, um, well, they always call us racist, but we have this black person, we have this Hispanic person, right? They're doing identity politics in reverse, mm -hmm. you know, trying to to disprove the attacks from the left. Um, but either way, it's not good, and I, I don't like it from either side. So, so we've been talking to people. Um, I, I guess I should say, in their words, racialized black people who um, who are critical of the idea of race itself and think that we need to dismantle the idea of race, actually, mm -hmm. um, that race is, you know, is um, not just a social construction, but a one that's that's bad for black people and that what we really mean when we talk about race is actually culture very often that when we talk about it, we're really talking about cultures or, or various cultures that are, can be quite different from each other. I mean, um, and, and that we should, and that race is really not as an impediment to a discourse. It's impediment for solving problems. It's an impediment for lifting people up and the, and the like, have you thought through that yourself or where, where are you on, on those, those issues? So, you know, the, the race aspect, here's what I'll say as far as black Americans, you know, part of the reason why race is important for us is because we don't necessarily have a country of origin specifically to associate with. So, you know, if your parents are Chinese, you're a Chinese American, right? Which you can point towards the Chinese culture. Uh, you know, you have a country of origin that references a culture of origin. You have all these different things. And so when I, I become more and more open to listening to other black people who are even on the right, who make reference towards black culture and its potential importance of having it because they don't really have a country of origin to kind of point towards. I personally hate being called African-American because I'm not African. Uh, and, and for many of us, we have lineage here farther than many white Americans. Um, and so at what point, <laughs> right, at, you know, at what point do we become Americans? Mm -hmm. Why do we have to associate with Africa? Um, but if people want to build a Black American culture, and it is for a positive thing, then I've thought about it. And, you know, then I, I don't think that's an issue. 
I think the problem has been at times where uh, creating a culture surrounding race has been used to separate people. Um, you know, so you can go back um, during Jim Crow, white colored, right? So that was a, a racial aspect to separate people. That is something that I am weary of by using that. You could separate people by country of origin. You could say uh, like, you know, no Chinese allowed, no Irish allowed, you know, those things have existed. Um, but, you know, the, the race part is a little bit different for black Americans, like I said, because we don't necessarily have a particular country of origin like other people do. But part of the reason is because, yes, because of slavery, but also because many of us have been here a long time in regards to our lineage, but we just have a messy lineage for a lot of us um, to try and figure out who is where and who touched what, uh, who mixed with who. Uh, um, you know, my wife, for example, is lighter skinned. And there's kind of like this mystery as far as, you know, her great grandfather, you know, was he white? You know, people not really sure. You know, so there's there's a little bit of a messy lineage um, for many of us to kind of figure out um, how mixed we are with other cultures. Uh, how long have we been here? How many generations? Some people are able to track it all the way down. Um, but, you know, obviously not all of us were even part of slavery. You know, my father's from Trinidad. So, you, you know, it. It um, hits me, and someone recently said that Black Americans are the most culturally influential subgroup on the planet by far. I mean, it's not even mm -hmm. close. Like, if you look, like, you know, people in China are emulating the culture of Black Americans. I mean, by the hundreds of millions, if not billions, right? Um, yeah. You see that all over. And and in some ways, it is a unique contribution. I mean, there's no question that's, uh, that 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 there are elements of of Black American culture have have really do, have really been globally replicated in a way that not, no that even white American culture collectively doesn't really match in a way. Certainly not per capita. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe maybe if you went back 50 years ago and you looked at sort of white Hollywood, you would you could you could say that. But today, I don't think that's the case anymore. And and so how how does that factor into your thinking about creating a uniquely black American culture that might not be that might be divorced in a sense from from your roots. In other words, you don't need your roots when you've done it here in a sense. Well, all right. So here's what I'll say ultimately when it comes to black culture, because there's there's been this conversation going on online recently. Um, and I contributed to it a little bit by saying that uh, is there a such, because people are saying, is there a such thing as black culture, right? And I understand where they're trying to come from by even asking the question, but ultimately, is there a black culture? Yes. Um, there is black culture because people believe there is black culture, right? Mm -hmm. What is black culture? Whatever someone deems to be part of black culture, you know? So if you're someone from Louisiana and you're someone from the Bronx, you have different viewpoints of what is black culture. Um, because there is a racial component to it, but there's also regional components, you know, um, and there's overlaps between Southern culture, general American culture, um, Northern culture. You have all these different overlaps when you talk about Black culture, but Black culture ultimately is in the eye of the beholder, just like most cultures. Mm -hmm. You know, I gave the example because, um, you know, I've, I've been interested in Germany. I've been to Germany, learned German. Um, you know, you can say there's a German culture, but when you go to Germany, people in the North say, we're not like the people in the South, right? There, there is a difference between that. Up North, they don't wear lederhosen, right? <laughs> in the South, they do, because they're Bavarian, right? So there's a different, it's a different cultural aspect. They sure. see themselves as different, even though they're from the same nation. So yes, it, it's all in however you deem necessary to kind of see it. Are there overlaps between a North German and a, and a Southern German? Sure, right, in different areas, but it really just depends on how you look at it. For me, it's not the culture part that that is a danger per se, um, as long as it's used to for a benefit or used as some sort of positive. I just don't want race to be a separating factor. I think it is 
it is far possible to have a black culture that you can celebrate um, that is not an isolationist kind of thing. To say you wouldn't understand, um, but it's a embracing kind of situation where, yeah, understand, you know, uh, use Germany, for example. If I go to Germany and I put on lederhosen, they're not offended, right? I'm a tourist and I'm trying to embrace their culture, right? And I think- You're gonna need those pictures of you in lederhosen. <laughs> right, you know? all right. <laughs> oh man. Joe, put, How... put them in the show notes, please. <laughs> uh, I actually, I was, I was in uh, Munich. Um, it wasn't during uh, Oktoberfest, thank God. But I was there during a spring festival and, you know, they had, you know, later hosen for sale you could put it on but i was like i'm yeah. not doing that um but it's you know i just want black culture to be something that is ultimately positive um that is embracing of different ideas right and not necessarily being monolithic but it's an expanding kind of viewpoint where someone like myself who dresses however talks however acts however votes however is embraced within this particular culture and it's perfectly fine um just like other cultures it may be now um the one thing in order to have a healthy culture and this is kind of what my book references to we have to be honest about the negative parts about the culture and that is my concern where people want to shine and talk about the positives and say, why are you bringing up those negatives? Or say, all oh, those negatives aren't everybody. Yes, but they are part of the culture that you want to have. So if you want a healthy culture, you got to weed out the bad parts. Can you give an example of that from your book? Sure. Um, so the bad parts are the hyper collectivism mindset. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I said, the, the rigidness as far as this is how to be Black. Mm -hmm. uh, the weaponizing of racial slurs against other Black people by Black people if they step out of line, so to speak. You know, that's these are negative parts of the culture, right? Um, the, uh, the immoralness of some of hip-hop, right? Or at least mainstream hip-hop, where we celebrate um, certain aspects of immorality. Um, the celebrating a single parenthood um you know i understand situations happen but we shouldn't be holding people up as being you know uh absolutely wonderful people and and so on and so forth even though they're advocating for people to repeat terrible behavior or repeat behavior that hurts children um in the long run which you know someone like myself which is why i'm even stronger about do not create children out of wedlock. I've kind of come to that old school traditional point of you get married, then you have children. Hopefully it works out in the long run. Divorce happens, people separate. But, you know, having children outside of wedlock, they don't have any skin in the game. There's, you know, ultimately what I'm getting at is we have to be able to talk about those things that we're clearly not doing right um, or clearly cheering on within this culture and saying that everything is fine, nothing to see here. And it's glaringly obvious there's something wrong, um, but we're, unaf we're afraid of saying something, even if you're someone who is not immoral, you're, you're someone who's upstanding person, let's say you're left-leaning or whatever, you see what's going on, but you're unwilling to call it out. You're unwilling to criticize, you're unwilling, you make excuses for it, um, you know, this goes kind of back to you know the situation with George Floyd. Clearly, this guy is not someone to celebrate. You can say he shouldn't have died. You can say this is injustice. You can say all those things, but we should not be having gold caskets and you know in a U.S. tour with his body. This man does not deserve something like that. We do that for very special people, and he should not be turned into a political martyr just because you think that's necessary for, for whatever reason, simply because he's black. If George Floyd was Hispanic or white, you wouldn't care, right? And, and you should utilize certain people and treat them in a, in a very particular way. And we should discard people, I don't wanna say discard this harsh, but we should discard bad ideas. We should not celebrate bad people. We should not celebrate immoral people. We should not make excuses for immoral behavior, you know, and 
I'm saying this because I do care about black people. I do care about the black culture. Um, and, you know, criticizing is to improve, right? If you give constructive criticism, if it's coming from a place of love, that's to improve things. So yeah. if yeah. people want a healthy culture, you got to be able to say, all right, there are positives. Obviously, you guys just talked about it. We are very influential in the world as a, as a group. But there are some glaring negatives that ultimately will to be our own detriment. And I'm actually being selfish because I'm black. You know, if we have a really strong culture, it benefits me. It benefits the image of black men and black people. So why would I want it to be worse? Right? right. Yeah. You know, the, it, it seems to me that there's this tension within every minority community in a sense to say, OK, on the one hand, I don't want you outsider who doesn't have my best interest in mind to criticize my culture. But if you do that, then what you end up doing is making it so you can't hear your own criticism, that you can't self-critique. You become you put up walls, you, you become fearful of showing your dirty laundry. And as mm -hmm. a result, you you externalize all your problems and then you don't have the the fortitude to to change. And I think, you know, I don't think that's a, a dilemma that's limited to to American blacks, but I do think it's one that that uh, that you have to constantly contend with and you have to say, OK, mm -hmm. maybe by airing it more than um, I am empowering certain people who will say bad things about us. But but you know what? That's that's less important to us than our own ability to to grow and to transcend and to change and to be dynamic and so forth. I have I have one um, question that I always ask if that's okay. And yeah. Jennifer may even is know what it, it is. Is it appropriation? No, but that's my other question I sometimes <laughs> ask. Um, but because I struggle with it so much, and it's the concept of systemic racism, and yeah. um, it's talked a lot about. I, I've actually at this point cataloged something like six different definitions of it from the discourse like you know you know everything from a particular institution that that uh, um to you know that to society wide it's it's in the it's in the you know the air that we breathe you know it's whiteness um you know uh, to redlining and the legacy of past policies that continue to haunt us today is still systemic racism so I, i'm never sure what it is and i'm not oh, i'm not sure you know, and I, I think that I think I, if you asked me, if you put a gun to my head and said, do you believe there's systemic racism? I'd say, yeah, I do. But I but I want to be able to talk about it and really drill down with somebody who knows what they're doing and to really think it through with them in an open way without being told that I'm a racist for even questioning the doctrine. What is your yeah. what is your view on 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 that? So um, I'm going to probably sound like I'm repeating myself, but the the phrase systemic racism i know where the the roots of it come from it's it's a marxist term um this is not a phrase that people use five years ago in the mainstream now all of a sudden it is something that we are constantly saying as if we've been saying this our entire lives right there's a very particular reason why we're using that term the marxists are cultural marxists and they've purposely interjected this phrase along with phrases like social justice to just be in the lexicon. And now we are constantly debating. These are phrases that are purposefully confusing. They're hard to define, they're ever changing. And for people like us who are trying to use rational thought and really discuss it, we are in fact uh, um, falling into the Marxist trap by even using their terminology because we're validating their terminology. So. For the most part, I don't ever reference systemic racism because I know what the roots of it is. I know what the purpose of it is. I know what the purpose of saying social justice, right? Because then we start having policies based on social justice. Uh, we say systemic racism to battle systemic racism, to have policies based on systemic racism and stopping system. So we have all these different things. These are words that are used to inspire change and ultimately inspires some sort of governmental change or social change, right? But who gets to dictate what that change is, right? And so you see all these different people, you look at, let's say, DEI, right? They are built to um, enforce social justice, enforce, um, you know, be anti-racist. These are, this is all Marxist jargon. Um, 
you know, to address systemic racism. Well, what does that actually mean? All right. And when you break that down, you start seeing that this is relatively nefarious things. They use very clever terms, uh, almost ambiguous terms like critical race theory. Well, what does that actually mean? You know, so you you have all these different things, uh, you know, the using of pro and anti, you know, anti-racism. Well, if you're not for anti-racism, are you pro-racism? Right. They set up these dichotomies. This is Marx's confusionary um, terms. I think I used that word right. But, uh, you know, they, these are very confusing terms. And, the, and it's to use people who it's to either get people to come on board because they sound like nice things. They say critical race theory is just teaching of history. Oh, OK. And you're OK with it. Or if you're someone who's being critical of it and saying, I don't really like this. Well, you don't want the teaching of history, of black history. You know, so it's a, it's a very. Uh, Marxist kind of way of kind of approaching the world. Uh, and so I, generally speaking, I don't address it. But if we were to say, is there a such thing as systemic racism? The only system that could possibly have some sort of systemic racism, and actually throughout American history that have had some sort of systemic racism has involved the government, right? So that is the only system that's at play that can enforce some sort of thing. Slavery was legalized. It was enforced and backed by the government. Jim Crow was governmental separation of people, right? So you have all these things. Those, okay, maybe those are things of systemic racism. What people are talking about as far as, uh, you know, trying to equate, if you get hired, you don't. That's not how private industry works. Pepsi doesn't collude with, with Coca-Cola, you know, and say, don't hire black people, hire more black people. That's not how private industry works. That's not how it works in capitalist society. Overwhelmingly, it doesn't work that way. Um, so there are other things at play. So ultimately, I guess what I'm getting at is if you break down the term, it, does it exist? Possibly so. I would only say that it could only exist by the hands of the government. Um, but I try not to get into the wordplay because that's what the Marxists want you to do. They want you to be confused. They want you to focus on this term, talk, constantly talk about it, keep it alive. Um, so I, I try my best not to do so. Yeah, I let the lie come into the world, but not through me, right? Yeah. Hey, so I've got one um, final question for you, Adam. I mean, and we're, we're looking at staring down two weeks until we're in 2020, if you can believe it. Um, mm -hmm. You- Oh, 2022. 2020, oh my God. Oh my God, did I say <laughs> what are you that? going backwards? Oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm so sorry, y'all. It was, it was the whipped cream vodka. No. Um, oh gosh. You can, blame it on that. you can blame it. I got stuck in 2020. That's bad. Please like, not, I, can we not go back to 2020? Oh, no, I'm so ready for 2022. <laughs> 2022, 2021, you released your first book. I know you're mm -hmm. writing. I know you're speaking. I know you've got Wrong Speak Publishing. You're trying to develop that. I'm going to, in our show notes, give the um, link to the, the live stream that we did with you on, on Wrong Speak Publishing, among other things. What is um, what are your goals for 2022? Not 2020, 2022, and um, you know what, what's on your plate for the next 12 months? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know the way my I don't know if I want to say career, but the way things are going for me, um, I'm just slowly progressing. Uh, I've been one of those people where I have no expectations. If people want to ask me to write, I'll write for them. I appreciate the opportunity if people want to speak to me, they speak to me. Um, you know, I've ran into some people who I, I, you know, I've seen online and I'm just like, oh, here they are. Um, you know, I've interviewed with people I never thought I would interview with. Um, so it's, everything's just been a blessing. I didn't know if 10 people were going to buy my book or 10,000 people were going to buy my book. Um, but I just kind of went at it as I'm doing this because there's a there's a greater message. Um, I is not even necessarily about making a ton of money. I've given away copies of books multiple times because I want people to take something away from it. I wrote it for everybody, um, and I and I constantly speak up in a way that is all encompassing. Um, you know, one of the one of the chapters in the book. I, I actually have nine solution chapters, um, but one of the chapters is basically talking about finding commonality with other people. So 
you know, I'm using my book as a bridge to find commonality with other people, uh, as an opportunity to discuss things with people who may not agree with me, but understand my perspective as to why I'm saying, and I give them good faith and to understand where they're coming from. Um, you know, which is why, like, let's say on Twitter, which can be a cesspool of negativity, I don't get involved in any of that. You know, I say how I feel, I speak my piece, I, I involve myself in good faith conversations very purposefully to inspire some sort of change where people will see like, oh, you can grow followers by being somewhat positive, right? Uh, you don't have to get into Twitter fights to get more followers, to get more notoriety, um, to speak clearly, be understood and try to understand other people. Um, but I, I guess ultimately for myself, um, I'm just writing more. Uh, I, I actually have an article coming out shortly in the Post Millennial. Um, I'm going to be actually writing an article very soon for Newsweek. Um, they invited me to, to write an article. Um, I was writing for Schoon TV on a weekly basis for a period of time. Um, so yeah, it, it, different opportunities have come up in, in my direction. Um, I feel like 2022 is going to be a big year for myself. Um, I'm speaking more in public. Um, I've, I've done, was it three or four speaking engagements? Um, I'm getting more comfortable doing so. I'm trying to speak more often. I'm basically just trying to promote families, promote fathers, um, promote free thought, free speech. Um, I didn't want to necessarily be the race guy, right? You know, I wanted to tell my story, use race as an example of, you know, coming together with people, um, you know, and when people read the book, you know, I'm, I'm kind of talking about black Americans, but it's almost like a case study because you can swap up black people and put in other, other nationalities. Um, I've had people from different countries that reach out to me who saw the similarities from their own community as in black American community and how I'm talking about it and found ways to relate to what I'm actually trying to say. Um, and so all of those different things, uh, how, how the book has impacted people really means a lot to me. Um, so I don't, I don't take anything for granted. So I figure, you know, just be myself and, and more things will come in my direction. We like you as you, thank you um, <laughs> Adam, for being you. And We're killing um, it. Yeah, You're killing it. you are killing it. <laughs> thank yeah. you. We're looking forward to, to 2022 with with uh, new stuff for you and and Merry Christmas too. Yes, Merry Christmas to you as well. Thank you for listening to this episode of Hold My Drink. Like or subscribe to the show and check out the show notes for links to source material and to our website where you can find what each of us is reading every week. Different news with different views. If you have a topic that you would like us to explore, drop us a line. And join us next week as we say, hold my drink and the conversation gets real.